Э, Alright. Alright. We are now going to continue our lesson from last week and then uh, we're going to quickly finish that. Uh, we're going to look at some New Testament scriptures tonight on uh, tithing and then and giving. And then we're going to go into our third outline um, about some more false teachings that we could talk about. There's only two in that outline on the third part, part, uh, part three. But first, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to study your word this evening. Bless those who are here today. Bless those who want to come but could not make it. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up your word, please open up our understanding and place it in our hearts that we may uh, take this word and make it change us on the inside and yes, we, yes. that people on the outside could yes. see the change as well. But we give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So go back to your outline on part two of false teachings in the Christian church as we were dealing with giving. We were dealing with giving and tithing. Go to page three. I think Yes, page three on your outline. All the way at the bottom where it talks about tithing in the New Testament church. Tithing in the New Testament church. Now, what is mentioned, as it says here, what is mentioned in the scriptures with reference in the New Testament church is now uh, relevant to all Christians of all denominations. Principle number one. See, when we talk about giving, we talk about the principle of giving. That's what we talk about. So, he talks about principle number one. And, uh, and the principle number one is this. As the outline says, giving is proportionate to the degree that God blesses a person without an obligatory uh, figure being mentioned. That's principle number one. Giving is proportionate to the degree that God blesses a person without an obligatory figure being mentioned. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. And I have it there too, but you can mark it. I'm going to read it from there, but this is, uh, I think that's the NIV version. So if you want to see it in your Bible, yeah, this is, this is the NIV. You want to see it in the King James. If you have the King James or the New King James, you can go to that one. But it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. And let's see what he told them to do. And it says in verse 2, On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So upon the first day of the week, each of you should give. So set aside a sum of money um, in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So once again, right here after the church has been birthed, which is in the book of Acts, we don't see, and you can't find any scripture after the book of Acts that requires you to give a certain amount. Now, if you remember last week, we said that the 10% is a principle, and we say 10% is good because it represents the whole. So if you want to give 10%, you should be giving 10% from your heart, not because you are forced to give it, not you are uh, uh, told that you are going to be cursed to give it. You should be giving it from your heart. And we're going to see scriptures that says that. So principle number two. Principle number two says, giving is from the heart. Giving is from the heart. Now this verse is taken from 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. It says this from the NIV version. Uh, no, King, this is the King James Version. So let each one, as he purposes in his heart, was it? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not, here it is, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
So, some of you may have another translation. Uh, if you have the New King James Version, what does it say in the New King James Version or any other version that you're in? NIV, who has a different translation other than the King James Version? Because I wonder what yours say about. But it's the King James Corfield, or is it. It says, it says not gradually, so you, have, you might have the New King James. It might have anything other than that. Um, because even in the New King James, so what do you think he meant by don't give grudgingly? What is that? I guess it would mean uh, obligated, being obligated. Or feel that you're being obligated. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Yes. Right, right. Grudgingly. I, you, you're giving, you're going to give it, but you're mad about it. <laughs> you're mad that you got to give it. And that's grudgingly. Then he said, don't give out of what? Necessity. Now, what does that mean? Okay, that you're going to get something back. Out of this, out, the out of necessity. Okay, now watch what he says. Let me see. Now this is the New King James Version. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful, watch he says, God loves a cheerful giver. Now, of necessity, another word for necessity or of necessity means or compulsion. Force. That's of necessity. Let no one force you. So underline in your King James Bible. Next time somebody try to show you that verse, underline necessity. You already know what grudgingly means. But of necessity means they're giving, yes, they're giving, you're giving uh, out of force. You've been forced to give. Compulsed. Compulsion. Uh, in the John MacArthur Study Bible, it says this. This refers to external pressure. And coercion, quite possibly accompanied by legalism. Believers are not to give based on the demands of others or according to any arbitrary standards or set amounts. Y'all know what that is, right? The pledge cards. Who's going to stand with me for $500? I want every family in the church to stand up and y'all take these pledge cards. Now, some people are going to feel obligated. Oh, it ain't. It's other people standing up, so I guess I'm going to stand up too. And then they pledge. Pledge cards are wrong. Because now you're giving out of what? Necessity. You're not giving from your heart. You're giving because you pledge to give. But what? It might, something might happen to you one of them months. So what you going to do? You're going to feel bad that you couldn't give what you pledged to give. He said, don't do it. Let nobody tell you to do anything like that. Uh, I told you about a pastor asked their members to give up one whole check. Their paycheck. Just, you know, we, we got to pay the bills. So I want everybody to give up their pay. That's giving out of coercion. That's giving out of necessity. That's what he's talking about. When they come up with certain amounts for you to give. Okay, here's another one. The $100 line, the $50 line, that's given out of coercion. That's given out of necessity. Yes. Okay, now I, there are a few churches around that ask for your your, your income, in your W-2, to find out how much you make. Now, aren't they compelled to pay 10% of that amount, whatever is on their W-2? They are they ask they're, them to pay that. Yes, that's why they ask for it. They're asking for you. They're asking for these W twos and uh, statements of how much you make, so they can do what to you? They can compel you and call and tell you to give out of necessity because they say, okay, you make this so you make this amount of money uh, at your job. So watch what they're going to tell you. You should be giving ten percent out of your income. Here's another one. Here's another one. If you want to be a leader in this church, you got to pay your tithes. If you want to be a teacher in this church, you got to pay your tithes. That where's that in the, where's that in the Bible? That you got to be 
a tither to do certain things. So now I just made me a club. I made me a tithing club. I made me a, I pulled a whole group out of the church. Here's the people that give. And the only people that really give, these are the people that are going to have the positions in the church. Because you just said, if you want to be a leader, deacon, trustee, any leader, any leadership position in the church, you got to be able to give your 10%. And if you don't give your 10%, then you're not going to hold a position. That's out of necessity. That's exactly what he's talking about. No certain amount should be forced or pressured on a congregation. He says, God loves who? A cheerful giver. So we already understand what the 10% represents. The 10% represents, uh, uh, it's a, it should be a good principle. It should be a start. But let that person determine if they're going to give the 10%. Somebody want to give 12%. But you have put this 10% on them so bad, they're they going to stop right there. You know, so yeah, don't let them try to force you to give. To give. So another thing, another scripture, that was 2 Corinthians, what? 9 and 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Now watch what he says there in the middle part. I repeat, there is no curse for not tithing. In the New Testament church, as uh, as is often implied or on sermons from Malachi 3, 10 through 12, we should not go back to Melchizedek. Uh, where tithing was an example and may be taken as a guideline or the Mosaic Law where tithing was by compulsion because they had to pay. Remember, in the Mosaic Law they had to pay their 10%. We already know that. Um, and then it says our Lord has fulfilled all the requirements of the Mosaic Law and taken the curse of not obeying the law away from us. That's Galatians 3.13. Somebody turn there. Galatians 3.13. I'm going to keep finish. The New Testament Christian should abide by the teachings of the Apostle Paul, which supersedes the law of Moses. I want you to correct that a little bit. Nothing supersedes the law. The law has been fulfilled. And we shouldn't say supersede. The law has been fulfilled. So we understand that. So whoever has Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. The King James Version. Yes. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Finish reading that again. Being made a curse for us. Stop. Being made a curse for us. Watch this. So when Malachi says you're going to be cursed with a curse, that verse just says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse or being made a curse for us. And to finish reading it. For it is written, uh -huh. cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So when Christ died on the cross, this is why they can't use Malachi, the third chapter against you, because Christ died on the cross. And when Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled all the of the law, the whole Mosaic law, that's Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's where you find all of the laws, right in those first five books. And uh, when Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled that. He became the curse. So once again, if you have accepted him as your Savior, there's no more curse. So now you should be giving, not out of compulsion, you should be giving from your heart, and you determine. As 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 says, you determine what you, you are going to give. Now, there's a blessing in giving more. And then there's, a, uh, he's going to talk about that. We're going to read that verse 2. But here's another one, Galatians 3.10. And it said, I'm going to read above that. Christians who insist on keeping the law of Moses or part of it are under a curse. That's Galatians 3.10. You know, you can put yourself under a curse. By, watch this, watch this, he says this in verse 10. All, this is Galatians 3.10. All who reply or who rely on observing the law are under a curse. So you can keep using Malachi 3.10 and all the Old Testament scriptures if you want to. When you use them, now you're obligated to them. Now you are obligated to them. 
Now watch what he says. For it is written, curse is everyone who does not. Curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So if you're going to, if you're going to take one law, which is tithing, that's one law, and try to live by that, then God's going to hold you to all of the law. Everything that's found, every law that's found in Genesis through, I think, Deuteronomy, you're going to be held accountable for all of it. So why, who would want to do that? I don't want to be held accountable. If Christ already did it for me, why would I want to put myself under a curse again? That's just like saying some people feel saved if they don't wear certain clothing because they go back to the Old Testament and says oh, a woman shouldn't wear anything pertaining to a man and a man shouldn't wear anything pertaining to a woman so women shouldn't wear pants in the church. Now they just put themselves under a curse if they try to use that verse to tell their member, their female members, that this is why you should not wear pants in the church. Because the Bible says in Leviticus, can't do that. Why? Because Christ did what? He fulfilled all of the law. That's why you can't harp on anybody about how long their hair is. You can't talk to anybody about their tattoos because you're going to go to the Old Testament and say, the Bible says in the law, don't mark your body. But we don't live under the law. We live where? Under grace. So don't use any scripture. Let's go back to the food. The Bible says in Leviticus, you shall only eat certain foods. But why are they only picking out tithes? Why don't they go to the Leviticus part about what you should be eating as well? All of that is under the law, under the Mosaic law. But they only pull out tithing because that was under the law as well. And he's saying here in the verse 10 that if you pull out one verse and try to keep it, God's going to hold you accountable to all of it. I don't want to be under the law. I want to stay right under grace and give as I have prospered weekly and give from my heart and give, you know, I'll be a cheerful giver. And that's what he's telling us to do. Now watch to the next point. He says churches advocating tithing are required to... Uh, as required, are putting a curse on their congregation. So in summary, given in the New Testament church principle, as opposed to tithing by law compulsion, Jesus clearly commanded, take note, that it was not an option, that we are to give to God. Now in Matthew, and then it's on your outline, we don't have to turn to it, Matthew twenty two twenty one. 21, somebody asked Jesus about giving. Should they pay to the government or pay to God? Jesus said, okay, give me a superscription. Give me a coin. And he gave him a coin. And he says this in verse 21. Caesar's, they replied. And he says, because Jesus said, whose picture is on the coin? They said, Caesar's. That's verse 21. And then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God what is God. Why would Jesus say that? He said that because Jesus was, now, let me ask you, was Jesus under the law or under grace? When he was alive, as a human, what was he under? Law. He was under, he was under the law. So what do you think Jesus is going to do? He's going to uphold the law. Remember, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So when anybody tried to use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't even use Matthew scriptures out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that talks about tithing because Jesus was under the law and everybody else was under the law. The law stopped when? When he died on the cross. That's when the law stops. So while he was alive, everybody was still under the law, including Jesus. So Jesus is telling him, yeah, pay, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and render unto God what is God. Meaning what? Pay your tithes. That's what he was talking about there. But that has nothing to do with us because we are not under law because we're after the resurrection uh, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he goes on a little further. Go to page five. Now, in, in page five, on page five, look at this 2 Corinthians 9 7. Each man, and we're going to read that verse, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What he has decided in his heart to give clearly has to be some amount, not zero. So in other words, God wants you to give. That's why he talks about giving. 
but he didn't tell you how much. It may be 10% or more. Well, it may even be less, but give as the Holy Spirit directs your heart, not as the pastors direct you. You're supposed to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody should be holding up all kind of cards. Now, you know, you got building fund projects. You have that. But that's a different, that's also different when you talk about building fund, unless they even try to make that an obligation on you. Now, you know, we're trying to build a church, so I want everybody here to give me $100 every month on top of your tithes and your offering. Okay, now you just tell me go to give out five hundred dollars. I make five hundred dollars a month. So how you know what I'm saying? So now you don't put another burden. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't make pledge cards. You can't do that. So in other words, I remember what Jesus says: before you build something, count the cost. Before you build it. So therefore, you got to be patient, like we are patient. When we want to go to get a building for ourselves, we got to be patient. We got to see what we have in a bank account in our giving, and we have to, you know, wait accordingly. We can tell the members, look, this is how much we have in the bank account, and we thank God for your giving. But until we get this certain amount, this is how much. This is what we're going to deal with. That's how it should be done. Not, well, I want to hurry up and get this building. So I want everybody to dedicate one whole paycheck. No, see, no, we can't do that. That's what I want. That's not what the Holy Spirit wants you to give. See, you got to got to see the difference. What people want instead of what the Holy Spirit. You know what? How much money you have? That's right. You know, so nobody should be telling you about something. Let me see. Like she said earlier, I want to see your W two, W uh, twos, and all this stuff, so I can determine. Now you really put the pressure. On that person, because now you know how much they make, and then you tell them, "Oh, you didn't get your ten percent last week." Mm -hmm. I mean, they do that. I'm telling you, that's what they do. You you cannot be a leader in this church. You can't do this unless you give this certain amount, and that's what he's talking about, and that's wrong. Now you can read page the rest of page five, and uh, oh no, go to the last page, back page, page six at the bottom. Here's something we should go by. When our giving, and this is taught in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. But this I say, somebody just ring the doorbell. Oh, Josh, right? He's going to the doorbell. See if it, I don't know if that door is locked back there. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So there it is. There's the principle of giving. When you give, you receive. And if you give more, guess what he says? God is going to give more to you. Notice, he didn't tell you how much. He just says you give a little, you're going to get a little. If you give more, you're going to get more. But he still didn't tell you how much. It just Because guess who knows how much they make? You do. So you determine. Now watch this, verse 7. Every man according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Once again, that's how we should give in the New Testament. Any questions, any comments before we move to our next outline on page 3 about giving, about money, about how it should be done? Any questions or comments? Okay, good, good. Let us move down to the next part. Uh, to the second outline, which will be False Teachings in the Christian Church, Part 3. Now, now, did you, oh yeah, do you all get the uh, outline up there with all the questions? Yes, yeah, now you can see all the questions that's there as well. So this is where I got the questions from. These are the questions you you guys have written out and asked. So that's what the, that, that that's what we um, will reference to. Oh, it's good to see you, Reverend Barnes came in. Good to see you, baby, baby, baby. Uh, Now the next question, the first question on this outline is buy somebody asked the question, buying pastors cars and gifts. Should we buy pastors Cars and gift. Now you tell me before we even read anything. What do you think? <laughs> Somebody said, "Okay, you said no. Why not? 
How come I can't buy my pastor a Bentley? What's wrong with my pastor having a Bentley? He gets salary. Okay, he can buy his own. Okay, you say he get a salary. So you're basing on that. The church already pays him a salary. So if the church pays him a salary, then he should be able to buy whatever car he wants to buy. So if you want a bill, he better save up and buy, and buy, and buy a $300,000 car. Okay, anybody else? Okay, that, that's good. That's good. Now, uh, the Bible, we're going to look at a few scriptures that talk about giving um, and this, what we call this honor, honor the pastor thing. We're going to look at some scriptures that talk about that. But look at this particular, I found this article. They call it the honor, the honor, the pastor scam. I honor the pastor scam. And he says, uh, in the whole article, I only pull a part out. He's talking about how some churches operate. And I pulled this particular part that he said. He says, money-focused churches tend to be ran, run on cultic patterns. Um, he said, one of these cultic uh, patterns is the division of the church into exclusive rings. Now, I talked about that earlier. These cliques, these exclusive rings. The all-powerful pastor uh, perched at the center, the inner ring or sarcophagus, which is another word for yes men, uh, around him, consisting of the pastor's lieutenants and the church's privileged class. Remember, we separate the church by who gives the most. So whoever gives the most, okay, that's one group. I want to keep this group and they get to do everything in the church. Then I'm going to separate them. Then the, uh, some churches operate after this, after they get that group together. So they are the rich, the famous, and the very pretty. Yeah, he's the, that's the privileged class. Then the outer ring of the ordinary folks who would love to be in the inner ring, but are not. So you got two groups of people going on in church. Those who give a lot of money, they, those ones that have the positions, and then those who give regularly, okay, we, we, we're going to be, we're going to separate this. Yes. single out these people and invite them into this inner thing because once they go back and count the money, are they looking at okay, well this one, we got to find out who he is and he, he can hang with us? Is well, if he's writing his offering envelope and paying his tithes like he's supposed to as for these churches, then I'm, 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 I, yeah, I know who you are. I already know who you are. So once again, they get approached to, do you want this position in the church? Do you want that position? Because you're a faithful giver. That's how they operate. So they know who they are. Now watch this. They go a little further than that. Watch this. So after they pick these people out, the power of those in the inner ring is determined by the amount of favor the pastor bestows upon them. Because the pastor won't pick these people because he knows who's giving the money to. So he gives them favor, gives them positions, let them do more stuff in the church than other people, any other other person would do. Like, in other words, I'm going to let, because you're a uh, giver, now your daughter, she don't even come to church or anything, she's not a part of our ministry, but she's about to have a baby shower, she can have our baby shower at my church, because I'm doing this for you. I wouldn't do that for nobody else. That kind of stuff. That's some churches, we got people that do that. It's your, these special little privileges for other people. Now watch, he goes a little further. Now, to get more to get more favor, the inner circle will employ many favor-curring measures, one of which is a scam called honoring the pastor. It works this way. The inner circle, the inner ring, will figure out what the pastor would like, say, for his birthday. Then the inner ringers will squeeze the outer fingers for the money to buy this item. Have you seen it done in the church? Watch this. Using this method, pastors have, have been given diamond rings, for their wives. Oh, come on now. He ain't even gave them. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, well, diamonds for their wives, cash gifts, jet skis, luxury cruises, motorbikes, cars, holiday uh, stuff, boats, and a myriad of other expensive luxury gifts. If I told you, to, you, you already know, uh, and if I told you, I, I'm going to tell you the gift, but you'll know what pastor I'm talking about that received this on his birthday. This is maybe about 10 years ago, probably a little older than that. But oh, no, well, it was, uh, no, that church didn't buy that one with the pastor. I got the, it was a uh, Mercedes. I don't tell the name of the church, but 
Yeah, the church did by the pastor's wife. Uh, I'm going to say this for her birthday. Uh, that just happened the like six months ago. Wife? The pastor's wife bought her Mercedes. Now, ten years ago, the church bought, the pastor already had a nice car. He, he was not suffering for anything. They bought him a Corvette because that's what he wanted. Now, wait a minute. This is church money. This is not somebody outside of the church who's saying, who may be wealthy and say, you know, Pastor, I feel like I want to just give you this. He can accept it and, or he can reject it. It's not that kind of gift. It was, I'm going to go to, I'm going to get my lieutenants and they're going to go about this. This is what we want to do for the pastor on his birthday. We're going to take $100,000 from the church. Well, you know, we got to raise it. We got to raise it first. And then we're going to go and buy him a Corvette for his birthday. Now, I already told you he's not suffering for a brand new car because he already got one. Him and his wife got one. So now on top of that, now he got two. So once again, this is the scam. Now they use, I'm honoring my pastor. Wow. That's why. Let me ask you this question. Are there any other ways you can honor the pastor? Come to church. <laughs> he said, come to church. What, what other ways can you honor the pastor? Be a faithful member. Yeah. Be a faithful member. Yeah. Give right and, and let him know, give him your testimony. Your, your hey, Pastor, your preaching and teaching is working. Yes, yes, that's yes, right. Yes, that's yes. Right. That, that's, that, I mean, that's good enough for any pastor to see faithful members come. Now, when they start, now, once again, if he's already on salary and he's making money, now you squeezing extra stuff. It's not that the church is like bringing in $30 million every year, because most churches that's doing this kind of stuff, they're real small. We not, now you know the big mega churches do it, but you, I'm talking about little churches doing this kind of stuff. They still doing it too. Uh, one particular person told me that uh, uh, they were at a particular church, and it was a small church, probably no bigger than ours, maybe 50 members, and they had been there for two, three years, and they fell, fell onto hard times, and they went to the church and asked for uh, some help, financial help, and the church told them no. But that next Sunday was the pastor's wife's birthday. So they made an announcement that next Sunday. And I think the person only asked for $100 to help to keep their lights on. So, But they said, no, we can't help you. So that next Sunday was the pastor's wife's birthday. And they made this great announcement. Oh, we're going to give the pastor's wife. They gave, I think they sent on a uh, $3,000 cruise somewhere. They did that. And they made this announcement. But, uh, that was for her birthday, yes. She, she was mad because she said she would have rather taken the money about her. And oh, that, that's that right. That was someone that, that's a member here from their previous church. Right. That's why they became a member here. But, yeah, she said, oh, I'd rather, she said, don't do it again. I'd rather y'all give me the money so I can get a <laughs> fur coat. That was the pastor's wife said. And the church is no bigger than ours. So, once again, when you see this kind of stuff, now we know people are, that's when you know ministries are out for the money. And it's sad to say, and you wouldn't think that churches are out there like that, but they are. They out there for the money. So that's he said, that's one way. That's one way. And then you might say, you might look at the last paragraph. Are the pastors complacent or complying in this game? Of course they are. They couldn't demand the gift openly themselves, but seek plausible definability by having their inner ring lieutenants do the work. Of course. They could refuse the gift when it is presented and make it clear that they don't want the Lord's money spent on such things again. But they never do. These pastors exchange their favor for cash from their congregation. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one particular well-known pastor, uh, you probably know him, Kenneth Copeland, it was his birthday. And all the pastors, a lot of pastors that he had helped, uh, he must have had a birthday party or something. And they flew from all over the country and all over the world, went to this birthday party for uh, Kenneth Copeland. And the gifts that they were giving him, they write checks on church accounts, 100000 150000 200000 It was so much money that they were giving, not from their own personal bank accounts, I can understand if you was giving Kenneth Copeland at his birthday party on his own bank account, your own bank account, $100,000, that's fine. This is on the church account. So it made such an uproar that it made the news, and that's when the IRS 
came in and, and all it, not just Kendall Copeland, every pastor that was there, okay, we coming to your church next, we coming to your church, we come because if you're giving this money to one person and this money is supposed to be for your ministry, why in the world are you giving this money on church account money to a person on his birthday? If you want to give him fifty thousand dollars, then you write that on your own check. Don't take it on his birthday. We get we have we have taken this thing to a whole new whole new level of wrong when it comes down how to spend church money. And that's what he's talking about, the scams of the cars and gifts. So, is it right to buy your pastor a car or gifts? If you use your own personal money, you can do whatever you want. You can get the pastor a car, a car, a fur coat, rings, whatever he want, but use your own money. But don't try to get a team together and say, we're going to get, all of us going to get together. We're going to rub our little two nickels together and get her a diamond ring. No, we're not going to do that. That's not what we want. We, we don't want that. That's why you don't know, you hear me talk about my birthday or my wife's birthday or our, our wedding. We're not, we not into all that stuff. We're not into that because it's not about us. It's about Christ. It's about Him. It's about serving Him. So why, why give me a brand new car when there's about 10 members in here who taking the bus? Can we just take that $100,000 and buy a big van or something and go let me, okay, you use it this week. You can, I mean, you can do that. Or you can buy everybody with all that money. You can buy everybody in the church a car. If you're going to do something like that, you're going to spend millions of dollars on finances on one person just because you think you are honoring him. Now watch this. Let's go to, oh, watch what he says. He says, your counter strategy, unless it's something reasonable like a bunch of flowers for the pastor's wife, <laughs> don't give to this sort of fundraising. Don't give to it. And don't feel obligated to give to it. You've got to give to his birthday. You don't have to. It was, I remember I was watching T.D. Jakes one time about four or five years ago. His wife was on there and she said, I think it was his 50th birthday. Or yeah, it was his 50th birthday when I saw it. I know he's older than that now. But uh, it was his 50th birthday. Now, you know, they come on internationally. She asked to her listening audience, it's Bishop Jake's birthday. He's turning 50 years old. Can everybody send $10 for the Bishop's birthday? Now, you know how many people watch Bishop Jake's? Millions. Millions. So you would think that instead of her saying send $10 to his birthday, because it's his birthday, why don't y'all send $10 so we can send it to the poor? It's not that. I want all y'all to send $10 because it's Bishop's birthday. It was my birthday. When you go send me, can the bishop send me ten dollars or at least a hundred? See, we don't look at it that way. We all look. Well, I'm gonna bless him because he is what the man of God. And if I give him ten dollars, then I'm gonna be blessed back. No, no, no. Y'all got that all wrong. If you give God's kingdom ten dollars, it's not him. It's God's kingdom. You're giving to the kingdom. Every dime that we give to this church or any church is supposed to be what? It's, to, it's supposed to, for the upkeep of the ministry and the spread of the gospel. Now, if you guys take a certain amount and give to the pastor, which is his salary, that's fine. You determine what his salary is based on how much money y'all are bringing in. But on top of that, as we know, some people get the salary and they get their birthday and they get this other income and they get that income on top of the salary. But once again, the members feel don't feel bad about it because they're the ones that came up with it, with the idea. Because they have been taught that in order for you to honor the preacher, let's look at some of those scriptures that talk about honoring the preacher. This is the only way we can do it is give them more stuff. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Right, so that's page two at the top. So we got some scriptures here. Somebody turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 14. And then somebody turn to Galatians. And as I read, I go to 1 Corinthians 9, 14. As you can see the other verses, let's look at some of these verses. And let's see, can we put them in proper context? All of those verses that you see there, we're not going to read them all. But all of those verses you see, let's take the first three. and Because uh, I want to get to that second false teaching. Uh... 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Let's go there first. And let's see what he's talking about. He's not talking about the pastor not getting anything. He's talking about this overextension of stuff that preachers are getting. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Now he says this, now really, if you read that whole chapter, it's a wonderful chapter that talks about, about the pastor and, his, and what we should do for him. Now 9, 14 says, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Now what does that mean? They should be supported by, by the ministry. They should be supported by the ministry. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How are we going to do that? How, how, how do we do that? Do we do it by uh, just buying all his needs when he needs it? Or do we do it by just giving him a salary and let him buy what he needs? Give him a salary and let him buy what he needs. So, once again, there's a scripture that supports that you're supposed to be supporting your pastor. That is scriptural. You are supposed to support him. Unless that pastor says, I don't want your finances, I'm doing fine. And there's many pastors that have said that. They refused the, uh, I don't want to be on the salary. Don't you guys, let's put that money right back into the church. You have pastors who have done that as well. But here's a verse that a pastor can use. Now, for us here at Christian Life, we just started, so, you know, we never chose to use that verse yet because we're small, and, we, and we're still growing, and we're still doing things. We never use this. I never use this verse, you know, so I thank God that I do have a, a job and receive income that I will never have to use them. And Paul chose, Paul says himself, that he chose not to use this this obligation. See, because this was an obligation to them. And Paul said, no, no, I, I could. I could be like everybody else and, and ask for an income. But I'm not. I'm not going to do it. And the reason he did not take income, because he knew that what people were going to say outside the church, that he was only preaching for money. Now it says, but other, 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 every other preacher have a right. They have a right to choose or not to choose whether they're going to live by the salary of the church that the church gives them or not. So that's one verse. Let's go to Galatians 6. Verse 6 through 10. Who has that? When you start reading there, let me know what version you're reading from. Galatians 6. And then we're going to look at one more First Timothy. And then for homework, you can read the rest because I want to get to this uh, next one, because it's very important. 6 through 10? Yes, chapter 6 of Galatians, verse 6 through 10. All right, I, I might stop you, so read real slow. Okay, I have the uh, Amplified, I mean the um, New Living Translation. Okay. Application. Okay. 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 Once again, talks about what? Income. For who? The teacher. And once again, we have already established that can be done through a salary. Right? Because if the pastor, he's preaching, and he's teaching Sunday school, plus Bible class, plus whatever other duties that he does as a pastor. So rightfully so, he can receive income. We're not arguing that. So keep going. Verse 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And then verse 10, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, mm -hmm. especially those in the family of faith. Okay, so remember, he started that section off by talking about being generous to who first? The pastors and the teachers of the church. Then he says, not only them. We need to do good to all those who are in the house, starting with the household of faith. So we should have this, this attitude of generosity. And once again, uh, giving to those who are teachers and those who are uh, you know, pastors. So once again, that talks about salary. Nowhere are we going to talk about this extra stuff that all this, you know, these gimmicks of trying to raise more stuff. To, to give to somebody. Let's look at one more. First Timothy 5.17. And then we're going to talk about the last one on the next one. 
First Timothy. First Timothy. I'm going to, once again, like I said, after I do the prayer series that I'm doing right now on Sunday, after that, we will deal with the last part of chapter 6 of Matthew, which is, that's a whole series by itself, and it deals with materialism. It deals with how to deal with luxury items, and then it talks about how to deal with necessity items, what, what our heart should be toward. When I say 1 Timothy 5... 17. Who has 1 Timothy? I'm in 2 Timothy. So I turn read 1 Timothy 5 17 if you have it. Well, I'm reading from the New James um, New King. New King, okay. Inspirational study Bible. Okay. And it's written um, that the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, so double honor. There it is. That's what the scripture that a lot of people use to say we need to give our pastor a Lamborghini <laughs> or for a coat. Because <laughs> he, he's worthy of double honor. So why do we automatically go there for materialism? What do you think he meant by the pastors and preachers are worthy of double honor? What is this double honor? Now, I'll be reading from uh, the uh, John MacArthur Study Bible. But listen, listen to what he says about double honor. Elders who serve with greater commitment, excellence, and efforts should have greater accomplishment, or no, greater acknowledgement from their congregations. Acknowledgements, not through materialism. This expression does not mean such men should receive exactly twice as much uh, as much re remarkation as others, but because they have earned such respect, they should be paid more generously. So guess what? Uh, put it in the check. Put it in his salary. If you think this person is worthy, and you're paying him a certain amount of money, and he's been paying this, been paid a certain amount. Oh, how come the pastor can't get a raise? In other words, give him a raise, not buy this extra stuff. It was a pastor um, uh, of Tabernacle Baptist Church passed Samson. away, Doctor Sampson. And I didn't know this till when I was talking to another pastor. He told me now Doctor Sampson was pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church for over almost 30, 30 something years. And, it, and come to find out, did you know he did not uh, have a pastor's anniversary, a birthday, he had a salary, and when the church tried to do stuff like that to him, he refused it. Now, you know, they just built that. Now, a lot of people thought that the million dollar church that they just built over there, that church was built based when he was alive. That money was saved from that regime. Those people just receiving the blessings of his ministry. He died before he could see it built. But they already had the money from there. And they said out of on his 30th anniversary, when he was about to retire, he uh, they did a he only accepted one. They did a banquet for him. They did this pastor's banquet for him. And then he said uh, the deacons went to the office and they wrote this large check, I guess. And he looked at the check. And he gave it right back to him. Now, he could have accepted that, that large check. And he, of course, the church had way more than enough money to give him all kind of luxurious stuff. But he just kept giving back. See, here's the whole point. It's, it's, people are going to suggest that you have this stuff. What about the preacher that's saying, no, I don't want it? See, that's, he also got to say no. He should also say, I don't need it. I don't need four cars in my driveway. I don't need that. I only drive one at a time anyway. Now, if you want to give me, you're just going to give it to me. Because I hear a lot of preachers on TV talking about, oh, somebody gave me the Rolls Royce. Okay, then if they just gave it to you, you can sell it, do whatever you want to do with it. But why do you have to hop around that you have two Rolls Royces, your wife has one, you have one. It was a gift, though. All this stuff was gifts. We shouldn't be harping on that kind of stuff. That, that's materialism, total materialism. So read those verses. We'll, we can continue with that particular point. But real quickly, we have 10 minutes. Let's talk about this baptism of the dead. Sister, you know, you had a point? Oh, that's Okay. We have this baptism of the dead. Anybody heard of that? 
Never heard of the 